Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is, as always, a great pleasure to welcome the Secretary General back to, to Washington, back to the State Department. Jens, uh, so good to be with you. Um, before I begin, and uh, with your permission, I just want to briefly update everyone on our efforts to assist Turkey and Syria in the aftermath of Monday's earthquakes. Um, the loss of life has been truly staggering, shocking. Um, we, uh, I think, along with uh, people around the world, are mourning those who have been lost, and uh, also our thoughts are so with those who have lost uh, loved ones. Um, so far, we have deployed more than 150 search and rescue personnel to Turkey. We have U.S. helicopters that are helping to reach areas that would otherwise be difficult to access. Uh, in Syria, we have NGO partners that uh, we funded over the years that are providing life-saving assistance to those in need. Across both countries, uh, we've deployed experienced emergency managers, hazardous materials technicians, engineers, logisticians, paramedics, planners, others, along with about 170,000 pounds of specialized tools and equipment. Uh, so that's been the initial response. Uh, in the days ahead, we'll, we'll have more to say about how we'll continue to support both uh, the Turkish and Syrian people as they work to recover from this devastation. Uh, turning back to today, uh, the Secretary General and I were last together in November uh, for the NATO Foreign Ministers meeting. The members of our alliance left that meeting in Bucharest even more unified, more resolute, and more committed in our support for Ukraine, which is in large part uh, due to the remarkable leadership that Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, has engaged in uh, over, uh, over the last year. During what has been a decisive time for NATO and for the world, his strong and steady hand uh, has helped steer our alliance in the right direction. Uh, now, as we approach the one-year mark uh, since President Putin launched his brutal war against Ukraine, it's critical that we maintain and increase that support. Uh, President Putin's war continues to be a strategic failure. He's failed to overthrow the democratically elected government of Ukraine. He's failed to subsume Ukraine into Russia or to break the will of its people. He's lost the battles for Kyiv, for Kharkiv, for Kherson. His military is suffering staggering losses on the battlefield. And he's failed to weaken our alliance and what it stands for. In fact, that alliance, NATO, is stronger and more united than it's ever been. Uh, today, we focused on steps that we can take to ensure that Ukraine has the security assistance that it needs to defend its territory against Russian aggression. And we'll continue that conversation this afternoon when we're joined by the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, and the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, here at the State Department. Uh, we've calibrated our assistance to meet Ukraine's changing needs from the outside of the Russian invasion, and that's exactly what we'll continue to do. Uh, two weeks ago, President Biden announced that the United States would send Abrams tanks to Ukraine. Germany committed to send its Leopard tanks and authorize other partners to do the same. Uh, this followed the earlier announcement by the United Kingdom that it would be sending Challenger 2 tanks to Ukraine's defenders. Last week, uh, we also announced two new assistance packages. Uh, which will provide critical air defense and counter drone capabilities to help Ukraine defend its people, including against the threat posed by UAVs supplied by Iran, which shares Russia's authoritarian vision and is increasingly aiding and abetting its aggression. We're also providing armored infantry vehicles and more of the equipment that Ukraine is using so effectively, like Javelin anti-tank missiles, artillery ammunition, and rockets for U.S. provided HIMARS. In total, the United States has committed nearly $30 billion since the beginning of Russia's invasion, and our allies and partners have provided more than $13 billion in military assistance over the past year and tens of billions more in humanitarian and economic support. The contributions that uh, Europe uh, writ large has made uh, to this effort uh, are very significant and um, making a profound difference. As President Zelensky has said, diplomacy is the only way to definitively end Russia's war of aggression and to create a path to peace that is both just and durable. Clearly, President Putin has no genuine interest in diplomacy right now. Here's what he said just a few weeks ago. Unless and until Ukraine accepts the new territorial realities, in quotation marks, there is nothing to even talk about. In other words, Ukraine and the world must somehow acquiesce to President Putin's land grab. That should be a non-starter for every country in the world that cares about the UN Charter and preserving international peace and security. The best way to hasten prospects for real diplomacy is to keep tilting the battlefield in Ukraine's favor. 
This will help ensure that Ukraine has the strongest possible hand to play at a negotiating table when one emerges. We also discussed the systemic and tactical challenges that China presents to the alliance and the broader international system. Uh, last week, Beijing violated international law and U.S. sovereignty with the presence of a Chinese surveillance balloon in U.S. airspace. This was an irresponsible act, in response to which we acted responsibly and prudently to protect our interests. Um, there is an ongoing operation to recover the balloon's components. Uh, we're analyzing them to learn more about the surveillance program. We'll pair that with what we learn from the uh, balloon itself, what we learn from the balloon itself, with what we glean based on our careful observation of the system when it was in our airspace, as the President directed his team to do. Now, we'll also share relevant findings with Congress as well as with our allies and partners around the world. Senior administration officials are on the Hill this week, and we already shared information with dozens of countries around the world, both from Washington and through our embassies. Now, we're doing so because the United States was not the only target of this broader program, which has violated the sovereignty of countries across five continents. In our engagements, uh, we are again hearing from our partners that the world expects China and the United States to manage our relationship responsibly. That's precisely what we set out to do. We continue to urge China to do the same. We're also continuing to strengthen and broaden NATO's partnerships and weave them together in new ways. The United States welcomed the Secretary General's visit to South Korea and Japan last week as an extension of those efforts, demonstrating the growing synergy between our Atlantic and Pacific alliances. And, of course, we're very focused on the accession of Sweden and Finland to NATO. These countries are ready to bring their strengths to bear on our alliance. They're capable. They're trusted partners. They're strong democracies that are dedicated to the values that underpin the alliance. We'll continue to push for the completion of this process as we head toward the Vilnius Summit in July. And as we look to Vilnius, uh, our alliance is working to operationalize the strategic concept to make sure that NATO is fit for the future including on challenges like emerging technologies, cyber defense, climate and energy security. These were all significant achievements uh, under the uh, leadership of Secretary General Stoltenberg in bringing forward uh, and having approved a new strategic concept for the alliance to reflect the realities of the moment we're living in and to project uh, what we need to do into the future. So it's a busy time, but we're confident about what our alliance can achieve, uh, confident because of the great unity that we've shown again and again over the last year, and confident because of the shared purpose we bring to the year and the years ahead. With that, Jens, over to you. Secretary Blinken, there, Tony, it's great to be back in Washington and uh, to be together with you again. I would like to start uh, by commending President Biden and the United States for providing such uh, strong leadership at a time when we face the most serious security crisis uh, in a generation. And thank you, Tony, uh, for your personal commitment and your leadership uh, on every issue related to NATO and uh, the vital bond between America and uh, Europe. Unwavering American leadership and bipartisan support have ensured that NATO allies are united uh, like never before. And our unity makes a real difference. President Putin launched his illegal war or aggression almost a year ago. Since then, NATO allies have provided unprecedented support for Ukraine. Around $120 billion in military, humanitarian and financial assistance. As the biggest ally, the United States is playing an indispensable role in supporting Ukraine. European NATO allies and Canada have stepped up as well, contributing over half of the overall assistance, including tanks, advanced uh, air defense systems, and other military equipment. Europeans have also welcomed almost 5 million refugees from uh, Ukraine, applied unprecedented sanctions, and decoupled from Russian gas and Russian oil. This shows how much we can do when Europe and North America stand together. Today, we discussed the situation in Ukraine. Putin started this war of aggression, and he can end this war today by withdrawing his troops from Ukraine and coming to the negotiating table. 
But regrettably, we see no sign that Russia is preparing for peace. On the contrary, Moscow is preparing for new military offensives. So we must continue to provide Ukraine with the weapons it needs to retake territory and prevail as a sovereign independent nation. If Putin wins, it will be a tragedy for Ukraine, but it will also be dangerous for all of us. It will send a clear message, not just to Putin, but also to other authoritarian regimes, that when they use force, they can achieve their goals. That will make the world more dangerous and all of us more vulnerable. Beijing is watching closely and learning lessons that may influence its future decisions. So what happens in Europe today could happen in Asia tomorrow. China is substantially building up its military forces, including nuclear weapons without any transparency. It is attempting to assert control over the South China Sea and threatening Taiwan trying to take control of critical infrastructure, including in NATO countries, repressing its own citizens and trampling on human rights, and deepening its strategic partnership with Moscow. So NATO allies have real concerns, which we discussed today. In this more dangerous and uh, more competitive world, we must continue to strengthen our deterrence and defense and further increase defense spending. And that is what we are doing. In 2014, under the Obama-Biden administration, all NATO allies agreed the Defense Investment Pledge. Since then, we have seen eight consecutive years of increased defense spending across Europe and Canada. With an additional 350 million extra US dollar spent. More countries are now spending at least 2% of GDP uh, on defense. And I expect that trend to continue. Today, we also discussed the importance of completing Finland and Sweden's accession to NATO. At the Madrid summit last July, all allies made a historic decision to invite both countries to join NATO. All allies have signed the accession protocols, and 28 allies have already ratified the agreement. Finland and Sweden are now being integrated into the civilian and military structures of our alliance. This has already strengthened their security, and it is inconceivable that allies would not act should Finland or Sweden come under pressure. It is important that we conclude this membership process as soon as possible. This will strengthen the security of all allies. So Secretary Blinken, dear Tony, thank you again for your strong personal commitment and uh, for the extraordinary leadership of the United States as we face global challenges together. Now turn to questions. We will start with Leon Bruno of the AFP.